So today we're going to speak about why Eastern spirituality doesn't need science. So we see this bad habit these days from specific teachers and individuals that think they need to validate their spiritual beliefs according to materialist science. So we see like Sadhguru and the Dalai Lama and that singing praise of their spiritual tradition because science starts to validate their tradition. But, you know, we need to ask the question, why do we need materialist science to, to validate Eastern spirituality? It's interesting, right? And I had an email recently from a gentleman saying, you know, he, he really appreciated that video I brought out I uploaded a year ago about why spirituality doesn't need science because he had spent his whole life trying to, you know, validate his beliefs to his, his father and his brother. And after he watched my video, he knew he didn't need to worry about that anymore because he didn't need to use science to back up his claims. But it's kind of an interesting thing, right? Because like, if we look at Eastern spirituality, like it goes back thousands of years the study of consciousness. And that's f so far ahead of like modern psychology and you know, other forms of science of mind, cognitive science, that it's interesting that just because it's kind of linked somewhat, people think it's linked to a religion, that we should not take those traditions seriously, right? So Meaning... Um don't need the science to prove it? Yeah, we don't need science to yes, prove it. Yes. But I'm saying that people don't take, you know, there's this belief that because they are part of a tradition, uh, like a spiritual tradition, that we shouldn't take them serious. Like, you know, the modern person shouldn't take them serious, right? So that becomes a big problem because if you look at, especially when we look at cognitive science now and science of mind, that they are starting to validate some Eastern traditions because this, the study of consciousness goes back thousands of years. Like even, you know, if you go into India, like Hindus will tell you that it goes back over 5,000 years, the study of consciousness and the study of the self in, in relation to the universe. And so one of the big factors is why Eastern spirituality doesn't need science is because we we have to look at the fundamental basis of both. Like if we look at science, the fundamental basis of science is materialism. Yes. So the world comes from matter and our focus is on matter. So we have this subject object reality. Whereas when we look at Eastern spirituality, the fundamental reality is consciousness and the reality is holistic. So, subject object split is eradicated in most of the deeper schools so we have this kind of non-dual reality this holistic reality where everything is interconnected and, and interrelated and so you have the universe as brahman you have nirvana as samsara samsara as nirvana you have this philosophy of the universe and of the subject of the self and the object as kind of one interrelated reality which is a kind of is it, the starting places are completely different when we when we look at that, you know. Yes, um, one thing that science just recently started to catching up is that they start to take account that individuals' experience as a scientific um, model of study, mm. whereas let's say um, fifty years ago. Maybe uh, if someone said the uh, experience they had during the meditation or something, they wouldn't take it too seriously. Mm. But now they start to take these um, individual experience seriously to study mind, uh, consciousness, and even like a sleep state, what uh, dream, and where, where are we when we are dreaming, when we are sleeping, and these kind of things. Because these kind of things, again, like you mentioned, it's not that we can measure and analyze by uh, meta. So that uh, now, recently, recent, like say 10, 20 years, um, they start to take these personal experience more seriously because mm. there is a thorough evidence and now they can pick up with a lot of uh, uh, analysis of uh, brain activity they connect with the, all these wires in our brain and they study 
which part of brain gets fired when we meditate or when we sleep and things like that. So I think that could be actually um, a mistake of science, not taking um, the personal experience too serious, very early stage. So it almost looks like now they kind of start to ca catching up with these ancient traditions. Mm. Well, Eastern, Eastern spirituality is an experiential-based philosophy. Or most of them are, right? So if we look at the three great traditions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, they're experiential-based traditions. So there's a focus on the individual experience of reality and what this subject is, as opposed to like when we look at science, science is focused on the outside world and matter and the study of how things operate in the outside world. So the, the, there's a complete difference, right? Like because Eastern spirituality is focusing on what's going on inside, they're focused on what's going on outside. But Eastern spirituality is saying once you know what's going on inside, you know what's going on outside, which makes sense, right? Because then you understand other people, you understand the way nature operates. You're not trying to study something as, as if it's like just some sort of objective reality that's uh, devoid of meaning or, or energy or feeling, you know. And this is a, a problem, like you said, it's one of the mistakes of science actually not to take the experiential factor seriously. As you know with Evan Thompson's work studying um, in his book Waking Dreaming Being, there's the focus on the study of Tibetan monks, like you said, sleep state, um, dreaming, and also the process of when they die. So where there's still some remnant of something that is there sometimes for days after the, the physical body had, had passed, the heartbeat had stopped. But yes, the interesting thing is even Dalai Lama once mentioned that... Um, they actually can witness the difference of decaying the dead body mm. from just lay person to a monk who dedicate lifetime to um, meditate and practice spiritual practices. Mm. So the lay person, after they pass away, the lay person's dead body will decay very quickly mm. in, in comparison with the monk's body. Mm -hmm. So it, in Tibetan Buddhism, they believe that... Um, more practice you do, more spiritual practice you do, your consciousness is so um, active mm. even after uh, your death. Yeah. So that uh, uh, they have a more like a buffer time mm -hmm. um, uh, from the body to the um, enlightened world, whatever you want to call it, that mm. consciousness uh, don't leave and but they live in maybe they believe in a reincarnation. So um, whether they're gonna transcend or whether they're gonna come back, mm -hmm. so that uh, time that the consciousness go through is much longer. The lay lay person, mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. uh, physical body don't uh, decay as quickly as a lay person's body. Well, we've seen all those images, right, of like Buddhist monks, like whether it's Theravada monk or a Mahayana Tibetan Buddhist monk where the body is like kind of like it's been in a like a like it's a pickled onion like it's kind of been sitting in some sort of liquid but it hasn't but the bo the body seems preserved after death like it's not going through like the if you've had experiences with dead bodies like a shrunken stage and in general and and you know the the color has has kind of gone out of the skin but you see in these monks where they're not that shrunk and the skin looks still, you know, it's a bit pasty, but it looks, it doesn't look like the ordinary, like you said, the ordinary lay person in death. So that goes to show, I think, that it, once it, you're always residing in that pure consciousness, it has even a, a, a greater effect, not a greater effect, but it also has an effect on the body, you know. So yes. uh, Obviously, the pure consciousness is not bound to the body, but if you're always residing in that pure consciousness, that's kind of replenishing the life force in that body constantly yes. when you're in that state. And, you know, there's a lot of studies to validate that as well. And, you know, it's only now, as you said, that, that science is taking that seriously, right? So 
for a long time that was thought of as you know ah, oh, that's just mystical stuff from the east and mm-hmm. we don't want to touch that but then there's you can't deny a lot of that now because it, it exists and we, we are seeing the benefits of meditation you know to, to, to keep in what we were talking about it's it's kind of interesting because there's more so a lot of eastern spirituality infecting western science as in the other way around really when you think about it right like because we're seeing the benefits of meditation mindfulness satipatthana we're seeing the, the the benefits of these practices on the mind and on consciousness itself on on things that medication can't take care of like so when we have people have long-term anxiety and stress issues and so forth and so on when you when you introduce mindfulness and meditation to their daily life and you tell them just to slow their life down and and stop being so busy you you tell with the way they look their eyes that there's a complete transformation going on as opposed to when they were busy and this and that their eyes was you know a bit more dull their physical being was not as open you know, there's a lot of things that those practices contribute to an individual's well-being. So because of that, now the science is taking them. We, seriously. Seriously, yeah. Eastern spirituality, seriously. And we shouldn't make a distinction here. We're not talking about Western religions or any sort of Western form of spirituality because that's a whole different conversation. We're talking about Eastern spirituality here, our forte. So, but it's... It is interesting that a lot of people think, because we live in the world that we live in, right? We live in this materialistic world where science is like the the paragon of reason, like, you know, it's it's held in the higher echelon. And so we, we think we need to have science validate everything that we do. But science has only been around for not that long. You know, it's, it's, it's a pretty new game in town compared to the spiritual sciences of the East. And like you said before, like when we talk about a spiritual process, so we're everyone listening and watching this and you and I, we're all going through a form of spiritual process through our life onto liberation in this life or the next. And all the one after that. <laughs> and that spiritual process is completely experiential. And so it can only be verified and validated by your own consciousness, by your own state of being. It can't be validated by someone else, unless you're with a, you know, maybe a, a, an enlightened guru or something like that, or a teacher who can guide you through the path and and have a sensibility of where you are on the on the path. But that spiritual process can't is not something that equates to some sort of scientific inquiry from Western science, you know. Yeah, definitely because. Um, like the same incident happened to us, right? Mm. And because our uh, background when we were raised and uh, our characteristics and are different, so that how you take it and how I take it is two completely different things. Mm. And how can science prove that that's this or that? Because it always differs from who experiencing it mm. right mm. and yeah that's something that we need to take and consider and the scientific inquiry is always evolving too so when when are you going to take science's perspective are you going to take it now or a year's time from now because it's constantly evolving and it should evolve because the understandings of material the material world will change as you know we know more about it but the internal landscape which we all have the similar, we all have the same feelings, right? We all feel anxiety, stress, love, compassion, forgiveness in, in different degrees, different degrees. So, but that has been explored for thousands of years and that, ha- that exploration has not changed. You know, actually it was, we could say it was probably more evolved thousands of years ago because people were more probably sincere about it and they would, put, they would take themselves out of the environment to explore their nature, where now we, you know, we want to cater towards our material needs, so we stay in the society and explore ourselves, which can be good, but can also have detrimental effects if you're too materialistic and too attracted to distractions and and, and stimulation. So, 
there has to be uh, science have to learn how to validate that that inner exploration hasn't changed it's the same as what it was thousands of years ago we've got more access probably to tools to explore that now because you know we have the such a wide variety of information in the world like never before you could study buddhism and yoga and vedanta and Taoism in one day and you know you can do that all in one day you can study you, not that you would know everything about it but you could study in, like pieces of that and never in history has that been available because of you know amazon and and all, and all of that and the internet but getting back to what we were talking about we we don't people don't should not get in the habit of thinking they need to be their existence needs to be validated by a mat material science you know we a, a bad habit people have not just in what we're talking about is people think they need to be validated their existence needs to be validated by other people and all you're doing is you're hoping the opinions of other people you know coincide with who you who you are or who you think you are it's interesting isn't it that is very interesting point definitely because uh Science also brings this a way of thinking. It does bring this way of thinking. Yes. That uh, how we always want approval from outside to mm. get, oh, I don't know, to get treated a certain way or they're chasing a certain social status and, mm. and somehow that boosts our ego and that makes us feel good mm. and makes, feel, makes us feel like, uh, oh, I am somebody and... Mm. Yeah, I am important person, and that are uh, very yeah closely related to very also the very the scientific thinking mm. that we need um, uh, this uh, reasoning and uh, why it's like this, and we need to uh, prove why it's like this. Then we take it as uh, truth, mm. right? Mm. Yeah, and this kind of process uh, gets us to think this very analytical and somewhat very superficial way as well yeah we constantly need proof yeah, we need yeah. proof we need to be validated yes and we have to get out of that habit yes you know so mm -hmm. if you're studying one of the great traditions you don't need someone else to approve of who you are and what the path that you've chose to follow i mean you're still depending then on external approval yeah and you should, you don't need that you don't need external approval we're constantly we're, this this materialistic self imagery world that we've created is we're constantly looking for approval you know people say to me like how can you do what you do and don't you care what people think and it's like no i don't because why should i actually worry about what people think this is what i believe in and this is what i do and if you don't if you don't resonate with that that's okay there's other things that in the world that you can you know that you're that you're attracted to obviously yes we need science but what we also need to understand is that it's very important for us to know how nature works because we are nature as well. Mm. Meaning that nature is what, not like, um, I don't know, copy and paste kind of thing. Mm. It, it takes time, it's slow and it's very organic. Mm. So it, um, um, this tree affects the next tree and grass affects the soil. It's kind of, maybe I'm talking something obvious, but this is something that we need to kind of think more carefully about it because our being works like that. Our brain works like that, right? It's slow and we get affected by outside influence and we get affected by other people and you also affect other people as well at the same time. We need to understand all these dynamics of nature in order to um, actually use science to benefit the nature, mm, right? Not the other way around. So that, I mean, how many times we see these um, people in a documentary or people around us uh, saying to us, like you just mentioned, uh, what uh, Western, Western medicine works for like one or two weeks, right? Mm. The people who suffer from um, depression or anxiety um, but just taking pill regularly cannot do everything mm. because we need to change 
a whole lifestyle. That can suppress the problem too, more. From taking the... Taking the medication, yes. of course, yeah. Because you're not, you're not tackling the problem head on. You're taking the medication. You're thinking that that's going to alleviate you from your suffering. But all that does is push it down further and further. If you stop the medication, as doctors will say, that problem will come back. Yes. Maybe even stronger. Yeah, so what we really need to do is um, what, cause, what causes the depression, right, in our mind or in the individual's mind? And, um, what causes panic attack? What's the problem? Yeah, this would be just... We don't need to, well, yeah, obviously finding causes, but we need to be more observant of who we are on the inside. Because well, we're, we're going through life haphazardly, right? We're going through life haphazardly and we don't know really how to control this vehicle or what this is, what the mind is, like we talked about the other day. Most people don't really think about the mind. They don't even know that they have a mind in the sense because they're they're caught in the mind stuff. So once you become just observant of the internal world, that instantly has a a great effect. We've all all experienced that when we've we've discovered Eastern spirituality because there's a focus on the internal world and <clears throat> there's like a most of us experience like a great boon because we think wow like you start to understand things about yourself then <clears throat> you know because you're observing yourself and you're like i never thought about that i was like that i never thought that i had a bad temper i never thought i was you know so forth and so on yeah you, we get to realize how much we don't know about ourselves right exactly like um yeah like, oh, I'm so reactive person. I thought I was so calm. <laughs> like, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, most people don't even think they're calm or they're reactive. They just, again, like I said, they're just going through life haphazardly. Like, not, not even a thought. Not about a thought it. about it. <laughs> so, well, have, well, you only have to have a look at the world outside, right, to see the evidence of that, that people are not observant of themselves. And so you, when you're not observant of, your, of yourself, you can't expect people to behave in any sort of, you know, good manner. There's, there's only going to be people in friction with other people unconscious of who they are. And so when you're unconscious of who you are and you're coming against other people who are unconscious of who they are, then you, you're contributing to an unconscious reality. And that's really what's happening in the world. That's why there's an um, ongoing conflict as well, because we are all asleep, and the, the, the message of the Buddha when he said, I am awake, it's, he's completely focused on the internal, internal world. He's, he's got out of that external sleep that you just mentioned where we're just out there and we're like, we think we're this physical being in opposition to an objective reality. And so we're in this survival psychology where we're just trying to survive in a world that appears competitive and and... It's survival of the fittest. And sure, there is an element of that, but the real world is not competitive and survival of the fittest. That's what we need to understand. That's what the Eastern spiritual traditions are teaching us. So the reality is not, from an Eastern perspective, is not you against the world. There's only the world. You're a part of the world. This is the basis of holistic psychology. You know, this is how ideas of oneness and unity actually come about, where you and a flea, there's actually, you are both important to the world, to nature, as you mentioned before. And there is not this sharp separation between your existence and the flea's existence, so to speak. Of course, in a human body, you have the opportunity to become enlightened and and break free of the cycle of samsara, but... From a naturalistic perspective, uh, from this holistic realm, there's not a sharp distinction between your existence and something else because everything goes together as one. And one of the problems with science is that because they have this distinction between this here and that something out there, they can't come to the conclusions that Eastern spirituality, spirituality have, come, have come to about mm. this holistic reality because their starting place is completely different there is someone who is observing an objective reality and they're studying that as if it's like like it's a laboratory when 
the real study should be on the observer themselves, you know, because the reason why there's different opinions in science is, well, obviously, because the subject sees the world differently and that subject sees the world differently as well. So you're going to have these different explanations of, of, of uh, some sort of scientific inquiry. Yeah, well, Moody once said that there is a, what, seven billion universe yeah on the planet yeah, yeah. because what's going on in here yeah, yeah, exactly. is universe exactly because like you just mentioned everyone experiences life differently mm. so everyone has different version of universe right yeah yeah and that's how that can affect science you know it affects our just our general perception of the world too subject you know our subjective experience is affected by our experiences, about what we've, the information that's come into our existence while we have been alive. This all affects our perception. Even language affects our perception because you think differently with different languages. And likewise, when you study science, those people still have all of those experiences, but they're studying science and then they're, they're studying the material world and then their perspective and their opinions can be can affect their scientific inquiry. So should we take them on board or not? You know, it's that's really up to us if we believe someone, you know, if we should take this, the, the evidence of, of a scientist on board or not. And like you said, it's not to throw out science altogether. Science is very important. But the scientific inquiry, in some sense, when, we, when we're talking, especially about consciousness, it has to change. Because they'll never understand consciousness if it, if they have a perspective of that there is a subject in opposition to an object. They'll never come to any conclusion that the Eastern traditions have come to because your starting place is wrong. The, start, the, the starting place is that no, reality is not dualistic. Reality is non-dualistic. And so the subject-object split is actually just an illusion. The subject-object split is an illusion. Yeah, so Eastern spirituality doesn't take in account that subject-object relationship. Well, the all. deeper element is mm -hmm. that there is no... Yeah, non-dual. It's non-dual. Mm. Atman is Brahman. There's no separation between this world out here and the world going on inside. Whereas in science, mm, there's always a subject an object yeah. and a scientific way of studying things never um, include the subject mm. always always object yes always yeah. objective mm. that's what i find always kind of interesting that that's probably why people who study philosophy in a scientific scientific manner like to just discuss about philosophy mm -hmm. but they never include themselves in the philosophy that they study yeah. to better their life or something like that well that's why alan watts would make fun of academics and he would say that they do philosophy they're not engaged in the philosophy like mm -hmm. he said they're not applying that to their own life they just do philosophy they go to university and they teach the philosophy but they themselves are not applying it to their own life that itself is very scientific um, um, attitude it is you could say yeah mm. it is a scientific attitude mm. because you're, you're looking at the philosophy as some sort of objective system yeah. and you're teaching it as an objective system to other people who themselves are objective to you <laughs> so your whole basis is not that you're experienced in this and you are understanding it because you are applying it to your life, but you, you kind of just, it's like me telling you about sugar, but you've never tasted the sweetness of sugar. How can I describe sugar to you? If I never tasted it. If you've never it, tasted, yeah. you don't know what sweetness is. Yeah. I'm telling, oh man, it's, you know, it's good, man. You should, you know? <laughs> but you're like just looking at me like, I have no idea. You've got to engage in it. And this is the, thing this is why evan thompson in, in that book waking dreaming being was saying that more scientists actually have to get engaged in the 
meditative experiences to understand this a lot more. Like, for example, when science talk about pure awareness and they still are on the fence as, as to the conclusions of Eastern spirituality that it's not part of brain matter because everything in science is matter. So they, they assume that pure awareness itself must be a part of brain matter, but they won't engage in what is required to understand that pure awareness. And what is required to understand that is deep meditation for long, extensive periods of time. You know, we're talking years here where you have to engage in daily meditation and other spiritual practices to understand that pure awareness that's at the basis of all the three great traditions. But they won't do that because that in itself, even, well, this is the, the scientific rationale on that. Even if they came to the conclusion that they had experienced some sort of form of pure awareness that was not bound to the body, they have no way of proving it to other people. And so they're caught in this kind of conundrum where they, don't, they can't explain it to their other colleagues in science. And, you know, they definitely don't want to fall down that, fall into that trap. So, but for everyone listening and watching, they don't have to worry about that because you yourself are engaged in the spiritual process. You don't need me or you to validate the the depths that you're going to and the understanding you and I are already sold. We, you know, we don't need to be sold, but it's, um, you don't need to validate that. And see, science is caught in this game of validation where they need to work off proofs and facts. And what, what could be more factual than thousands of years of highly skilled meditators saying that this realm exists? But because there's no way to show physical evidence of that, because it's, not, it's non-material, then they don't accept it. And this is where the problems with science and spirituality happen, because spirituality itself you know, is about a non-material world. It's about, even when we think of just psychologically, when we think of feelings, emotions, and this and that, they don't have a physical quality, do they? But we all experience feelings, emotions, and thoughts. What does your thought look like? I mean, I mean, it's just stupid, right? It's a silly question. The only way that you could describe that is if in the images that you have associated to the thoughts. But thoughts themselves, you can't, you can't explain. And so this battle can never actually be resolved because science is looking for material facts on spirituality, which is non-material. And how do you experience the non-material? You've got to go back inside yourself. And what is science going to do? They're not going to go back inside themselves. Then, then, you, then, then it's pointless. It's a pointless discussion. I mean, it's a pointless discussion to try and persuade a scientist either way. That's why I've never bothered with it, you know, because it, it doesn't go anywhere. And it reminds me of situations. You know, we mentioned Dalai Lama. We mentioned Sadhguru before. It reminds me of that time. There's a few... Oh, I'll mention a few examples. There was that time when... Deepak Chopra was sitting with Sam Harris. And don't get me wrong, I like both both guys. They're both highly intelligent. But Deepak was out of his depth here because he went into... We have to think about Sam Harris, right? Sam Harris is a, he's a strict atheist, but we know he has a deep love for Advaita Vedanta, Vipassana, Dzogchen in Tibetan Buddhism. He has a deep love for these because he understands these practices and knows, you know how they actually, him being a neuroscientist, how they benefit our, our psychology. And Deepak had, you know, he's teaching Vedanta, but he's mixing it with quantum physics. And, you know, a lot of the quantum physics that he's mixing it with can be a little squirrely, you know what I mean? Can be a little hard to define, a little hard to explain. And Deepak had this thing, I don't know if he still has it because I haven't listened to it, much of him for a long time, but... He had this thing about quantum healing and stuff like that. And I think there's some validity to that, but I never got a lot into it because it, it you know, it can be loosely defined, right? So anyway, when he's sitting with Sam Harris and he was mentioning things along in this vein, this quantum healing and this and that, and Sam just, 
you know, being just, just tore him to shreds, tore him to shreds, you know what I mean? So Sam being a scientist, a strict scientist, thinking the way as a scientist does, subject, object, split, Deepak trying to explain something, but not having enough tools to try and solidify what he's trying to explain, he got tore apart and he got made look like a fool and it brought down things like Vedanta, you know, you know what I mean? So it, it, it really irks me because sometimes I, I wonder why so-called spiritual teachers want to actually engage with these scientists because it's like, there's not much to prove, really, because the starting place of both is completely diametrically opposed. You know? and, another, and another one, another example, which you, you had watched before, was when, I think it was 2008, there was a consciousness conference and Edward Slingland you know, being a, a sympathizer of Taoism, a teacher of Taoism, I would say a, a scholar of Taoism and Confucianism and the Warring States period of China, he posed a question, Sam, was, Sam Harris again was talking, and he posed a question to Sam about, I may have got this wrong, but I think it's along the lines of the psychological benefits of religion. So like, as, as a lot of the science has scientific literature has proven especially in cognitive science that having a religion actually can in some sense alleviate a lot of anxiety and, and stress it's usually the atheist who is more stressed and anxious and live in an uncertain world when you have a religion for example people who are a follower of a certain religion have a worldview that gives them peace of mind Whereas an atheist, you know. And so Edward sort of, he posed this question to Sam and, and Daniel Dennett also was in the crowd, another famous scholar, and both Sam and Daniel just, <laughs> they, they tore shreds off Ed. And there's, you know, that's, again, another example of how the both worlds don't, it's, it's hard to communicate, actually, if both are not, being objective and open with each other and if both have a firm grasp of what they think reality is you know Richard Dawkins is a perfect example right anyone who speaks to Richard Dawkins about any form and I know that his aggression comes from Christianity because you know again that's another problem mm. some of the Christian beliefs you know we don't want to get into that but Richard does have a lot of he does have a, a good point about a lot of that but someone like him you can't even even if you came from an eastern spiritual perspective i don't think that you could reach him you know there was that time when graham hancock you know challenged him to have an ayahuasca experience with him and he kind of just brushed it off he said oh maybe there's something there but he brushed it off he didn't take it serious because it could really negate his whole life's work richard's whole life's work so I, this is why I, I made that video last year and that's why we're sitting here talking now because it, it, there's not going to be... Science are not going to accept what spirituality is saying or Eastern spirituality is saying. They're not going to because the whole orientation of how they study has to be different. I think it's very important to um, accept each other's point of view mm. instead of try to prove their point of view is right mm. or opposed to the other school of thought. Mm. I think it, that two different m way of thinking and study is going to be, I don't know, parallel forever. Mm. I'm not so sure if, do you think going to meet at some point Within the crossroad? I don't think so. Not at the yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah. The crossroads would be in taking the observations of Eastern spirituality seriously. So I see the crossroads being work in cognitive science, for example. So we see like the Mind Life Institute in Dharamasala, which is established with the Dalai Lama, Evan Thompson, and all of these scientific philosophers uh, philosophers professors and so 
you have science, you have scientists, and you have the Dalai Lama sitting together. So that's that's an evolution, right? You wouldn't have had that a long, a long. You know, you wouldn't have had that a hundred years ago. It was impossible because the worlds are too separate. So I, I can see there being a relationship there, and I know a lot of people will say, "What about quantum physics?" Yeah, I, I guess there's some relationship there with quantum physics, but. There is a lot of uh, woo-woo quantum physics out there too. You know, a lot of new agey quantum physics, that's not true. I would say read the work of Sean Carroll. Um, he's a proper quantum physicist and a lot of the things that you may have watched on What the Bleep and all of that sort of stuff is actually not as true as what that was made out. So you've got to be really careful when you when you think about those sorts of things. So I think that there is going to be most of the work that, or the, what you were talking about, the, the unification between both in consciousness studies. But if the perspective and the starting place of both is the same, how are they going to... There's not really a chance, right? Because science have a materialistic perspective of the world. Materialism is fundamental. Eastern spirituality, consciousness is fundamental. The starting place is completely different. Science have to accept, not accept, but when they, when they explore the mind, they have to take the, the, the 5,000 plus years of Eastern spirituality seriously and consider that consciousness is fundamental. I mean, quantum physics accept that to a certain degree that, that consciousness is fundamental. But there's that's going to be a big jump for them, for science, mm. to accept that. Yeah, they how quantum physics came to conclusion without consciousness being observer, there is no physical form. There's no physical form. Yeah. Mm. Consciousness is fundamental. That, yeah, exactly. That is to say that uh, fundamental, fundamental creation of universe is consciousness. Exactly. Mm. So what was before the Big Bang? Brahman. Tao, Shunyata. What was after the Big Bang? Brahman, Tao, Shunyata. What was during the Big Bang? Brahman, Tao, Shunyata. It's all Brahman. You know, so when you have that fundamental reality, actually, this is why people like Carl Sagan and that, they turn to Hinduism and that because the, the knowledge, especially of the Hindus going back thousands of years, makes sense. When you look at the Yugas and Sagan was like, he was a big proponent of the Yugas, if you can believe it. He was like, there's something to this. You know, they're talking about cycles. They're talking about the birth of the universe and also the collapse of the universe. But they, they're speaking about it through mythology. They're speaking about it through imagery in a very artistic way. You know, as, as we all know, Hinduism is a very artistic spirituality. Yeah, very sophisticated because... Um the one thing that blew my mind was that how yoga system, so the uh, the Hindu ancient Hindus, the time mechanism mm. is based on our heartbeat. Yeah. So the heartbeat taken as um, in today's time a system like a second, mm. like so that's how they calculate this from this the speck of time to the the large long period of time, and they yeah this that system uh, was based on human heartbeat and they used it in such a sophisticated scientific manner to measure period period of time mm. in regards to period of consciousness as well at the same time and that's something was wow like it's crazy. that's incredible mm. in how that long ago they came up with that idea even like it just well, 5,000 years ago. More, likely. Yeah. You know, because like it must have existed before the Puranas. And if the story of the Kurukshetra battle, 3,102 BCE is correct, and that was what existed at that time, then how long, the, the, how long has the idea of the Yuga been around? And like you said, judging it from the heartbeat and the whole calculation of time again is, again, see, internalised. They've internalized something to understand something external. Exactly. Because there's the understanding that 
well, how do I understand this? Well, I understand this because this is part of that. This has grown out of this. Like, like what Alan Watts said, you, you yourself are the big bang still becoming. You are the big bang becoming. You were once the big bang and before the big bang, whatever that is. And so that's you becoming. You are becoming that. So how do you understand that? Well, you can't understand that by studying the outside. You've got to go back into where the source of the Big Bang came. And that's within yourself. But in that way, we can say it makes so much sense even in scientifically. Yeah, that's what I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, that's, why they, that's what they call, some people do call Eastern spirituality spiritual science. Because it is, it is a, so in some sense, it is a scientific inquiry. Yeah, super. Right? Super, you know. In the classical sense of science, you know. So you're studying yourself. You're studying the nature of the universe, basically. Even like Eastern uh, medicine is the same. You work with the pulse. Yeah. They somehow know just feeling of your wrist, your pulse. Uh, I think you have problem with the gallbladder yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and colons. And yeah. Like how? Like and it's accurate. Uh, it's just crazy. It's accurate. Ayurveda, you know what I mean? Again, this, like one of the points in that video I made was... And the reason we don't have to validate is because these systems are, in and of themselves, they are comp complete systems. You look at Taoism, right? You have the medical component taken care of. You have the understanding of the psychosomatic organism, so you, the understanding of the movement of energy within the body, the understanding of consciousness. They're complete systems in, in and of themselves. There is a scientific component to it. As you said, like with traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture and all of that yeah they work with points in the body and even the medicine is mm -hmm. from earth too yeah they're using this uh, herbal medicine and they work yeah. i mean it um takes mm, longer than just the pill mm. but again the effect of pill can last only short amount of time too but whereas uh, herbal medicine natural remedies may take longer, but it fixes you almost entirely. Yeah. Well, it's the same, exactly. It's, and, and the corresponding tradition to that is Ayurveda, right? So the points in Ayurveda, the murmurs, and, you know, your constitution and everything, it's such well thought out and in fine detail. Yeah, exactly. The Ayurveda, again, based on the five, ele five elements yeah. of nature, um, they divide into three different constitution of human body, mm. which based on characteristics of person and biological differences of uh, person. Yeah. yeah, everything. And and uh, once you find out what constitution that you may belong to, then mm. they'll um, prescribe the food, what the food you need to eat, the f just like... Um, Treat it as a medicine, mm. and yeah, uh, your type of body uh, is and not uh, tolerable with a certain food, and so you should avoid. And how your body may react in season differently than other people, and you eat differently, your because your body act, react differently. Mm. It's such a complete study. Mm. It is definitely. Yeah. Shout out to all the pitters out there. <laughs> pita, yeah. I don't know, uh, really, pita butter maybe. Pita, pita I think your yeah. yours is pita, yes. Um, and you're some sort of crazy pita vata or something like that. Yeah, pita, pita is what S super sensitive and yeah, yeah, yeah. Intelli intelligent. Intelligent, usually smaller body type mm. and element is um, water and fire. Yeah, water and fire. Yeah. Um, I'm vata. Airy fairy and you know really <laughs> <laughs> yeah all the different very interesting and very fun to study that too like. I know Ayurveda yeah definitely if you want to get in, into Ayurveda Vasan lad start with start there but there's a lot, you know there's so many well versed scholars and teachers in Ayurveda so but see that they see those two systems are part of a greater totality where these are spiritual systems that are complete in and of themselves that don't need scientific validation right they already have their own scientific method yes so then what this is the problem that we live in right now we're only considering 
Western science as the be all and end all of judging everything else. So science, because they're judging everything else, it's almost become its own dogma. It's become what it was a re- what it has been fighting. It's been fighting religion, right? It has been trying to be open and honest about an inquiry, but it itself has become its own dogma. And this is what, if if you remember, R- Rupert Sheldrake, when he had that TED talk, I think it was back in 2012, 2013, sorry, and he his talk was about how science now is a religion. It's it's the new form of dogma, and we're we're judging everything in reality based on this materialist perspective. And what happened? Ted took his Ted took his talk down because Ted themselves don't sympathise with. Oh, they've they've come a long way since then. Trust me, but because they got a lot of flack for this, they took his talk down because, and I think they took Graham Hancock's talk down as well because Graham talked about ayahuasca. And, and Why did they? Take these people on yeah, well, for the who, show. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? They probably what? didn't know. They didn't know what they were going to get. But <clears throat> Rupert himself, being a scientist, you know, he he took a shot at them and, and brought them down, brought them down a peg. And but he, why they took him down is because <clears throat> he struck a nerve. He struck a nerve, obviously, because it has become its own dogma. So everything now. See, it's difficult. Like, for example, say, like, if I was on Joe Rogan, right? If I was on Joe Rogan and was speaking about Eastern spirituality and this and that, all him, all he would maybe be talking about, or, or, or whatever scientist would be there debating me, would be, but that doesn't fit into the scientific narrative. So then it becomes a problem of Eastern spirituality has to fit into the scientific narrative. Do you see? Like this is this is where it becomes a bit crazy, and then then if you said, but the scientific narrative is just built on the materialist perspective. It's built on subject object split, and Eastern spirituality is not about that. It's about no split and consciousness as the foundation. That still wouldn't be accepted because that has not been scientifically proven. Likewise, the other one hasn't been proven too. Do you know? The, the, the idea that matter is fundamental has not been proven as well. Hence why they can't come to a conclusion on what pure awareness is. See? They can't come to a conclusion on that. But we're supposed to accept this model that they have. Isn't it ironic when you think about it? Almost like taking some sort of mythology into fact and mm, yeah. they will do anything and everything to defend that agenda. Yep. Yeah, that is um, yeah, not that very far-fetched from being religious. Well, it's not because it's a dogma. It is a dogma, right? Because if you don't fit into that narrative, you will be discredited. Because you need to have material proof, material evidence that something is... Ex- exists but you know as someone like Bodhidharma would say show me your mind prove your mind exists can you we experience the mind but we can't I can't just I'm just here yeah prove um, consciousness in in the brain yeah how are you going to prove that you experience it so you're taking away this experiential realm. You're, ex- you're excluding a big part of where science could actually make a lot of advances, the study of consciousness. But you've got to accept that the experiential realm is also a laboratory as well. You need to get into the spiritual laboratory inside here and study what's going on inside there as opposed to what's going on here. This study out here, of course, this is needed as well. And we've made a lot of great scientific advances in the last 100, 100, 200 years. But if the scientific advances can only happen out here and, and there's going to be no focus on what's going on in here, then it's, it's a pointless endeavour. Because we need to work out what we are first before we start jumping to other planets and 
you know, we're, we're all running around from away from the source, you know, instead of going back within to the source. Yeah. This is why the, you know, the Dalai Lama, getting a bit more blunt in his old age, said when when he was asked about last year about psychology, and he said, ah, psychology said it's at a kindergarten level compared to where we're at, and that, there was a lot of truth to that, because when you do take into consideration the evolution of his tradition of Tibetan Buddhism of the Nyingma tradition all the way back to Nalanda University, back in the 5th century CE, you know, they, the Nalanda University existed from the 5th century to the 13th century, you remember. It wasn't like a short blip of time. For like um, five, six hundred years. Yeah, it's a long time it existed. Very long time. Yeah. And there was a, a, an exchange of communication between the Buddhists in China and Tibet and, and India and also Sri Lanka and, and Thailand, there was constant communication between people were passing through Nalanda University and there were a lot of advances in that university in the study of consciousness because it was such a place that, it, well, technically they call it the first ever university, right? That, And it, it was primarily focused on Buddhism, but Buddhism is focused on the, the study of consciousness. Nalanda is instrumental in you know, the advances in Mahayana Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism and so forth and so on. And so Dalai Lama making that statement is not wrong. Because if it was the other way around, right? Say if it was the other way around. If Nalanda University only just started now, but psychology was from the 5th century, we, we would have no problem in saying, oh yeah, Nalanda University is at the kindergarten level. We would have no problem in saying that. Mm -hmm. But because we live in this scientific under, under this scientific dogma of materialism, him saying that is controversial because he's basically saying that psychology itself as a discipline is far, far, far behind where we're at. Yeah. Um, actually, psychology has been around just over 100 years. Mm, exactly. It's not even longer than science, actually. Mm, as a discipline, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a yeah, discipline, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because like when we think of psychology, we think of like Freud, we think of Jung, yes. Adler, we think of these sorts of people. And that's, yeah, like you said, that's just over... Just over 100 years. Yeah, just over 100 years, yeah. And th those three specifically made a lot of advances in the study. It's not to say psychology, there's... Like psychology is completely bunk because it, it is a gr great discipline. But... The Dalai Lama's point is that if you look at the time scale and you look at the extensive study, and if you look at India in general, India being focused on this endeavor of understanding the self, understanding the universe, then you can't c compare with psychology. You just can't. Because you're not just talking about Nalanda here, you're talking about 5,000 plus years of inquiry into the nature of consciousness. There's such like, like immense, incredibly immense amount of study in mind that had done like f five thousand years ago mm. in the East. Yeah. There's so much to study and learn about. Exactly. You almost never come to. The, you never, never it, complete it. it. It's just an infinite. Infinite. Yeah. Whereas, Western psychological study has been. Not even 150 years. Exactly. Well, you and I are constantly studying the Eastern traditions, right? And there's... It's an overwhelming amount that you could study. It never ends. Never ends. Never ends. You don't... Sometimes you don't even know where to look Yeah, first. exactly. Yeah. But you just follow it. You follow it because it, it, it's... It, it, it's the great knowledge on the nature of consciousness. It is the knowledge on the nature of consciousness, actually. Eastern spirituality is the knowledge on the nature of consciousness. And this is what science has to accept. Though, yeah, you've got all of these traditions and this and that, and they're great. And they, But what are they doing? They're just validating older knowledge, like cognitive science. They're validating older knowledge. Why not just 
accept it, that that is the great knowledge consciousness. It doesn't mean you have to become a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Taoist, but you at least need to consider the knowledge and the understanding and the wisdom that they, they, that, that they came to. Yeah, just recently I watched this documentary talking about um, Big Bang theory and uh, in relation to like a Buddhist text. It seemed very far-fetched, but um, something very interesting there that in so many Buddhist texts, and not just Buddhist texts, also Taoist texts as well, saying that everything exists in pairs, yin and yang, mm. for example, male and female, and um, what in Hindu tradition, lingam and yoni. Mm. There's always this... Um, what. Um, Parvati and Shiva, Shiva. Mm. and everything in pairs, mm. and everything everything has polar opposite. That means. So in the Buddhist text, in I don't know what stra exactly it is, but saying everything is in pairs, and you need to understand uh, if you are there, there is some other pair, mm. other opposite out there, and this is we're talking, who knows, five thousand, four, five thousand years ago. Um, but then the CERN, this institute in Switzerland, they study the birth of universe. And, um, and they uh, have been studying this uh, very, like, a, the base yeah, sub particle. Sub subatomic sub particle. Subatomic parti particle. Mm. And they also were studying that they found this little thing, I forgot how they call it, um, the center of the subatomic particle, and they found a, man, a few many different um, elements which uh, consist of consist of the the center of mm. the subatomic particle, and uh, all these things, all these elements exist in pairs, mm. Mm. and some other elements they didn't get to a conclusion, they couldn't, um, they didn't have enough uh, information and evidence to prove that they, they had the other um, pair, hmm. there's some other uh, elements. Hmm. But very recently, but they ob obviously they studied uh, the element uh, in hypothesis of it exists, the, the other opposite exists. Hmm. All these things exist in pairs, that was the hypothesis. And the, some things they couldn't get to conclusion recently, mm. they found out they were the, the other pair. And that uh, hypothesis was made by Einstein mm. like more than 100 years ago. Mm. So now it's been kind of proven mm -hmm. by science, yeah. but which had been written Thousands of four or yeah. 5,000 years ago. Yeah. And I mean, it. It was a uh, like a quite a remarkable thing, but at the same time, I was like, oh, "Yes, of course." Yeah, 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 and you knew about it. Eh? Yeah, 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 and it's just so. Yeah, it's just science is just this material science is just catching, catching up. up. It's almost like we need modern language to tell ourselves the same story that we already know. Yeah, Do you understand? <laughs> but it is like that, right? Yes. So we're, we're not comfortable with using Shiva or Parvati or Lingam Yoni or Yin and Yang. We're not comfortable with these, this terminology because it's wound up in mythology and spiritual science. But we're comfortable with using uh, the, na the names of, sub, uh, of subatomic particles and we're, we're comfortable with using the scientific terminology. So it, it's constantly like, almost like we're telling ourselves the same story over and over again but we're framing it through the language that's comfortable in that zeitgeist, you know, in that current zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because, uh, yeah, like you said, like, yeah, you know, like, yeah, of course, of yeah, course. Like, of, of course. Co I was like, yeah, oh, well, of course what did you expect? Of course, that, <laughs> <laughs> of course there's the opposite particle that's, yeah. you know, yeah. that complements the, other, the yes. o other opposite. Yes. Again, like the thing is that where science falls short is they, they, they don't count like 
obvious examples, like if we look at just male, female, right? Male, female comp complement each other. The union of them provides a child. New birth. New birth, the complement of yin and yang, the, the bringing the, resolving those opposites together gives birth to the awareness of Tao or the stillness of the Tao. These sorts of examples, as you could say, they don't accept because it's it's too like it's just an example. Like even though as practical as the male and female one is, they you know. But we know this all the way down the line, passive and active, you know all yes. all the way. Everything. You know, hot and cold. Everything. Everything. Mm. But because those examples are too obvious, they're not accepted. Like it's like yeah, but hot and cold just exist because of the temperature. Mm. Or male and female just exist because that's just how evolution you know, happened. And it's like, but don't you find it ironic that we have all of these opposites that complement each other? They're opposite poles, but they're not completely separate from each other. They, they complement each other and they, they balance each other out. They work together. They work together as in the basis of subatomic particles. They work together as well to create the fabric of matter. What's so surprising about that? That's exactly right. You yeah. know, it's surprising for them because they don't consider the obvious things that... They, see, this is the, one of the problems with science is they're completely disconnected from the intuitive mind. It's, it's all rational. It's all intellectual. So we need to have everything in tight boxes to understand certain things. Whereas if you're just intuitive, if you're just a human, I should say, then you explaining hot and cold, up and down, female, male, all of these uh, mutual opposites, I like to say mutual opposites, then if you're intuitive, of course you understand straight away. Oh, yeah, it makes sense completely. You don't need someone to come along with the calculator and... No, I don't know about that. Like, cause I'm adding it up. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't make sense to me. You don't need that. Yes. That's it, it's it's interesting because like if you take away the just the intuitive gut feeling aspect of ourselves, you you're just you're up here, and you're trying to calculate things and you're trying to make a logical conclusion about reality and nature itself. And the irony with especially when we study consciousness, is there is no logical conclusion because it's completely irrational. It's completely irrational. It doesn't coincide with scientific, in, uh, like scientific analysis or intellectual analysis. It's completely irrational. Yes, they need to have some the intuitive perspective, definitely, mm. and that's the somewhat. Um, again, the mistake of uh, a lot of scientists mm. that they this is they need concrete evidence to prove the basically the emotions and intuition yeah. Yeah. instead of embrace that part of our you know being mm. and use it to to your benefit. I'll give you a scientific statement, right? This is a scientific statement. The universe is unreal. Brahman is real. The universe is Brahman. That's a scientific statement. But they're not going to understand that or accept that because you're using Brahman. You're, you're stating that the universe is unreal first. There's a lack of intuition about the phrase that Shankar is speaking about. They don't quite understand it. Yeah, because uh, logically, completely, it makes no sense. It makes no sense to them, yeah. Mm. But then when you unpack it for them and you explain, you know, Brahman is the foundation, the universe is all and everything, the universe is unreal when you perceive it in a dualistic manner, so you, all you see is maya, so you see illusion, you're measuring reality. If you say you're measuring reality to scientists, you know, that's all they do. So when you explain this, it is a scientific phrase. It's a scientific statement, but they won't accept it because the conclusion of that scientific statement is that everything is non-dual 
and the idea of an out there and in there don't exist. There's only Brahman and everyone's a part of that. And that Brahman was before the Big Bang. It's within the Big Bang. It's within everything. That's a scientific statement, but they won't accept that because it's using Hindu terminology. It's from a uh, sage back in the 8th century I mean they're not going to they won't they won't accept that so but that's something that's to accept the the thousands of years of knowledge of the east then they have to they have to accept yeah they definitely have to take into account to accept it and um, that also will benefit their study mm. and that that could be the the way of the evolution of science yeah, of course yeah if you were to keep trying to prove things out of material realm I don't know there might be some limit Liveries with consciousness, as you know. Oh, yeah. Because well, it's non material. That's right. Yeah, they cannot prove it. They can't prove it. It exists. We know it all exists. Uh, yes. Because we ha we, we, we live Everybody does. We're living it. Yeah. That's the thing. And that's the only way that they, they will make any advances if they accept that. Accept that. Okay, like we can't prove that consciousness exists, but we know it's there. That's a big leap for them to to know that something's there, but they can't validate its existence. That's kind of opening whole new Pandora's box. Exa it? Exactly, mm. exactly. But we see with, you know, there there's a lot of hope there because we see with disciplines like cognitive science and that, that are actually uh, really considering what the East had had to say or is saying still and had has said for 5,000 years mm. there's a real uh, see science are going to end up in this really awkward position maybe in the future because science has always been in opposition to religion right in most most cases always in opposition to religion but what you're seeing now through research and cognitive science is that the benefits as I mentioned earlier of religion on the mind so where are they going to stand because the thing is is that okay they can say that religion isn't real and a lot of us would i mean a, a lot of the speculations especially of a lot of western religions you know can be pulled apart and and so forth and so on but if they are contributing to healthy people in general, you know, obviously there's the fanatics and so forth and so on, but you get fanatics and you also get scientific fanatics too. But if if it's contributing to the psychological health and well-being of people in general, then what what is what, what is science's position on that? Because shouldn't we strive for psychologically healthy and sane people in the world? Or should we just be striving for what is rational and make sense proof being proof based so they're going to find themselves in this awkward position because when you have cognitive science and, and those sorts of disciplines making that ground then they're saying like you know then you have books like robert macaulay's book you know yeah science is science is um how how religion is natural and, and science, science is, is not. not that's right that's right so when you have those sorts of conclusions and you know he's he's a, uh, a scientist and so you have you know you have these you could, this is going to be a problem for them in the future because that, that is a grey area but again cognitive science may end up in the the quantum physics part of science where oh, that's for the weirdos you know that's for the you know that's how people sort of in general think of quantum physics right that's for, oh, that's for those nutters in the back yeah, that is definitely interesting that, um, yes, 
the religion, religious aspect, and more so like a philosophical aspect, these teachings bring people together. Yeah. And allow us to feel each other's emotions and feelings. Mm. Whereas science is quite the opposite. It gives you, a f as I mentioned earlier, love it. It gives you a framework of what life is. You understand, like, so though m many disagree with a lot of religions, some religions, we could say almost say all religions, give people a framework of how to understand their existence and the nature of this world. And though, yeah, of, of course, there are some religions that enhance certain psychopathies you know like obviously if god is a lord and you're a subject and you, you, you always you always felt that you're a sinner and a sinner. this breeds unnatural psychopathy within people but when we look at eastern spirituality and we if, if we if we term them as religions then they facilitate a, a path for, of peace for people and of understanding the nature of themselves and what's going on outside here. And this is why, especially as, as you know, when you go to India and you see people who are, are very poor, but they're happier than the richest person in, in a developed country. Why is that? Why don't they live with a lot of anxiety and stress? Because of the tradition. Because every day they go down to worship Shiva at the temple they meditate a little bit in the morning, then they go about their day, then they go back there at night. And, you know, they offer, you know, they they make an offering to the gods yes. and they, they eat some prasad from the from the ashram and then they go home. And their life is, there is a vibrance to that life and an aliveness that you won't get in a, in a stale, developed nation. And so that has to be accepted by science that they for some reason these spiritual frameworks are giving these people peace of mind and giving them uh, a sense of ease in their life that the atheist doesn't have the atheist lives in an uncertain world and this is where a lot of existential angst comes from existential angst hardly ever existed back in the ancient times because everyone in a sense had uh, religious worldview yes but then as we evolved and scientific inquiry became more enhanced and we be we began to understand the material world a lot more coinciding with that is is atheism and this existential angst that we begin to have usually begins in most people's 30s right they have a, a existential angst that some people never get out of actually yeah. because they're worried about their plight in life like oh I'm going to die. Mm. Like, I'm really going to die, you know? And what does Eastern spirituality do? It makes you focus on your own mortality. Mm. Yeah, you are going to die. Let's have a look at that. Yeah, let's, let's, let's investigate. Let's it. investigate yeah. that. Why are you afraid of dying? Yes. What is death? Is death just a part of life? Or is death some sort of f final, like, exclamation point on your life and that's it? Or... Are you going to live on? Or, or is, or even let's go deeper. Is it only the body that dies? Because if it's the body that dies, then what, what happens to consciousness? Does it live on? Do you see, these are the questions that you come to if you explore that instead of like ignoring that or thinking about it in a materialist perspective. Because if you, if you are an atheist and you're listening or watching this, then there will be that existential angst because you will only think that there is just a physical body. Consciousness don't matter. This It's just a product of brain matter. And, well, this is going to die and I'm going to die with it. You know, And this is what leads into you know, nihilism and all sorts of things where people become very you know, pessimistic and downtrodden and they just kind of just live their life out as, as best they can. And there can be a beauty to that too you know some people do say you know i live in the moment and you know you only have this one life and this and that and they and they try to take advantage of it but then at the end of the day they still have that angst that oh man it's, it's coming to an end you know the days are ticking but the east offer freedom from that 
No, it's consciousness that is lives on and actually can never die because it doesn't have a form. It's beyond form. But it's encased within our form as we speak. You know. Yeah, the Eastern spirit spirituality offers um, that ultimate happiness we all want to have mm. over the existential crisis. Mm. And it, it allows us to um, explore our own emotions and fear in such depth, in a such mm, like vast teaching of mm. mind and knowledge, and which mm, s science cannot offer. No. Science has no solution to it. Medication. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. Again, but medication no. won't fix everything. Well, it can't fix existential angst, can it? That's going to pervade a person's life for as long as they live, in most cases, right? Yeah. So instead of, like, suffering from existential angst, the East are trying to resolve that for people. They're trying to resolve that. Wait up, let's have a look at this. This is how they. This is how the inquiries would have came back five thousand years ago, right? They would have came. Why do I have this intense fear of death? Well, we, let's instead of like being like everyone else and trying to avoid the inevitable, let's let's dive into this. Let's understand the body. Let's understand the mind. Let's try and. and then next minute, you had these systems that evolved. Yeah, that's just that's just incredible. It is incredible. Yeah. Yes. It's, um, yeah, the Eastern philosophy offers so much answers to our own emotional problems. Mm. That's what's so make, what makes it so important, I think. Mm. Definitely. Whereas psychotherapy can uh, lead to a certain uh, healing process. But nowadays, so many psychotherapists also study meditation and mm. effects of meditation yeah. too, mm. because they actually have seen like thorough result. Mm. Yeah, so there's so many like um, holes that the science cannot fill. Is all in the Eastern study. And like you said, those psychotherapists are implemented in those traditions because they see the, well, they see the results of it. They may not be able to explain it, but they see that, well, it tastes like sugar, so it must be sugar, you know? So let's provide yes. it for people. Mm. We don't have to analyze why it works. It works. You know, why have we become such an intellectual, rational creature? Like when something works, it just works. Sometimes there's no explanation. You know, there are explanations, obviously, to why meditation works, but ultimately, there's it's probably not as clear cut. You know, so we, we you know, meditation does prov provide you getting out of that prefrontal cortex in the frontal lobe here, where where stress and all of that originates in this area, and we can just reside more in this effortless and intuitive aspect of our mind, in the in the hot in the hot cognition which is very lucid and free from intellectual rigor, you know. And again, as we know, like what more than 95% of our mm, of time that we, our daily life in general, is more than 95% of part of the, uh, the hot cognitive mm -hmm. brain functions more than core, oh, yeah. core cognition. Meaning that uh, the unconscious mind dictates the most of time yep. when we are awake and when we are not awake. Yeah, exactly. So, like, you do the math. Like, yeah. uh, studying that analytical part of our mind is important. But why are we so invested into just that? We've just built a whole world around that, haven't yeah. we? 
even in conversation, right? You and I now in a conversation, the intuitive mind's even working even more than intellect. We're talking intellectually, right? And we're speaking, but still, the in, the intuition is picking up on social cues, is picking up on what will contribute to the the conversation. It's picking up on all of these, which is beneath the intellect. Sure, the intellect can articulate and do this and that, but it can't pick up on social cues and pick up on the, that subtlety that will contribute to a better conversation. Yes. You know, cognitive science is, is obviously understands this now. But this is, like you said, why are we investing all of our energy just in this part of our brain, which is actually causing us, which is causing psychological damage to us. You have teen suicides now. You have all of these silly things that happen in the world because we're training our kids and to be like adults from 10 years old. Make sure you do this, do this, and then we pile the homework on. And it's, it's inhumane. You know? When you're a child, cognitive development happens when you allow the, the child to just live their life intuitively and spontaneously because they themselves are like any other living organism. They have to spontaneously grow. Cognition is the same. This is why when you have overtrained people, you have very unnatural people, people who can't communicate properly, people who can't pick up on social cues, and so forth and so on. This is why you have the awkward scientist, <laughs> you know, so one who can't communicate or flow in a conversation with someone or, or just sense it like, you know, how to hang with someone, you know. But anyway, like getting back to what we were talking about, it's what we were mentioning earlier is that we we don't need science to validate our existence. So everyone listening and watching don't you don't need anyone to validate your existence, especially science. You don't need another person, and you don't need a discipline to validate your experience of life. You never have, and you never will. And the very fact that our Eastern spirituality itself is already a well-structured science on, on its own. On its own, yeah. And we do not need to uh, try to prove it the material science. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's something that we need to uh, get out of that sort of mindset. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They are complete systems in and of themselves. Yes. A lot of people get annoyed when I say that, but that's the way, that it, way it is. It's just so, it's complete. Yeah. Like, again, like, s for example, Ayurvedic um, studies, it offers all these um, uh, medicines through food and herbs. And also, there's this um, Hatha Yoga as well. As a, so it's a whole complete lifestyle medical study. And how can, how can we say that it's not scientific? Mm. Yeah, it's a lifestyle philosophy right it's yeah. composed of science it's composed of nutrition composed of health and well-being they're, they're they're complete lifestyle systems yeah and anyone who follows ayurveda or, or, or Taoism, they know that that's benefiting their life they're becoming healthier people more psychologically sane people and if that's the case why do we need science to validate their position in life you don't and that's yeah. that's the moral of the story you don't need anyone to validate you, and spirituality or eastern spirituality specifically doesn't need science to validate its existence though it is interesting that science is starting to validate its existence so anything else to add no i think we've covered a lot of things yeah and, and okay, again i've learned a lot mm. yeah good all right guys thanks for having us and <clears throat> make sure you check out my patreon page you know if you enjoy the content a small contribution any small contribution will help and make sure you like subscribe all of those sorts of things and we'll see you guys in the next podcast